Welcome to part one of a three-part series about race, health, and happiness in South Africa. As you know, we are bringing you a more international flavor for this season, and I was fortunate to visit Cape Town, South Africa, and interview some leaders on the ground. But our first interview of the three-part series starts here in Canada with South African-Canadian EDI expert, Dr. Nicole Kaniki. She's talking a little bit about her own life, her infamous family history, and giving us a brief orientation to life in apartheid South Africa. I hope you enjoy it. Not enough to survive in this racialized world. We are learning together to survive. This is Race, Health, and Happiness, and I'm your host, Dr. O. Today, my guest is Dr. Nicole Kiniki, founder and director of Sonomi Solutions Incorporated. Dr. Nicole Kiniki is a research methodologist with equity, diversity, and inclusion expertise skilled in strategic implementation of organizational EDI that is meaningful, intentional, and sustainable. She is committed to EDI that engages community and allows the work to be informed by underrepresented groups through trust building and all aspects of organizational processes. Dr. Kaneki has also led leadership roles at the University of Toronto, where she was the first ever Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Research and Innovation. And also at Western University, she was the Special Advisor on Anti-Racism. As a person of mixed race growing up in apartheid era South Africa, she brings a unique perspective to research and the intersection with equity and justice. Nicole, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Dr. O. It is such an honor and a pleasure to share the space with you. Oh, yes. I am so excited that we're able to do this because, as you know, we had that conversation before I flew off to to South Africa and you helped to orient me. And it was just a conversation, right? I think it was your idea. You're like, oh, let's have a Zoom call and like, uh, you know, talk about things and, you know, where you should check out. But as we were talking, I was like, oh, my goodness, this needs to be shared more widely. <laughs> like, yeah. wow. <laughs> yes, it was quite an interesting conversation. I think it just got really, you know, when you're going to South Africa, it's 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 such a complex society. It's such a complex country. Um, I like describing it sometimes as little Europe in Africa, mm. um, you know, mm-hmm. as you as you may have experienced. And so I like giving people just some context to what they may be seeing and kind of to be ready for it. So it was a great conversation to be able to chat to you about. Yes, yes. Well, so before we kind of dive into, um, you know, South Africa 101, I guess, um, for all of my guests, and you are indeed my guest, uh, I like to ask um, as a first question, what is your superpower? Like what gifts did you bring for us on your time here on the earth as we walk and talk and and play? Um, so let me ask, what is your superpower, Nicole? Well, I would say, and I hope, I mean, this is really what I hope I'm leaving behind is a legacy of listening. Um, it's been the word that's kind of been on my heart a lot, um, especially as I do this work of EDI. You know, building listening skills has been something I've had to really work really hard on in order to be able to do this work today Mm -hmm. that I do, um, that I think it's one of the most valuable skills that I've learned um, through much fire, um, you know, through much mistakes of not listening. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I hope that that is what I leave behind is that, um, you know, people who have worked with me, who, you know, have had a relationship with me, uh, find that I'm a good listener. Oh my goodness. I'm feeling that in my heart because, not because it's my superpower, but it's probably my kryptonite. <laughs> it's the tough, I'm a doctor. Have you have you watched us? We don't listen. You start talking and we interrupt. I think the average is six seconds. We say, how are you doing today? 
and then we cut you off, right? So I love that it's something that I'm working on and I love it to hear that it is your superpower. I need to learn more of that. Um, now, I think it's interesting where you say the listening also, because as Africans, we come from an oral tradition um, and we learn about our ancestors. And at the same time, you know, in a in in the world that we live in, there's also the important written tradition as well, right? Um, but the two sometimes intersect. And for you, like I said, before we jump into kind of a, a broader look at South Africa, I know that in your family's history, there's a connection with the famous uh, book, Book of Negroes, um, which I think you were able to make through the oral tradition connection. So can you tell us about your family's connection to uh, the the context or the content of uh, the famous book, Book of Negroes? Yes, yeah, so that was quite a life-changing um, point in my life, discovering that book. So I happened to be in grad school, actually, at Western. Um, uh, I was working in sports medicine, um, so I was finishing my PhD, and there happened to be a um, another student, a master student, and um, he and I always shared sort of a love for for books. We loved mm-hmm. historical fiction. I love I love fiction. Love also fantasy, sci-fi type fiction, but um, historical fiction has definitely always been one of my favorites. And so um, he just finished a book and he said to me, oh my gosh, Nicole, you need to read this book. And um, the book was The Book of Negroes by Lawrence Hill, um, a Canadian writer. And um, he uh, borrowed me the book and I started reading it. And as I'm reading it, it was just one of those, you can't put it down. Mm. You know, you start it, and it's just, you know, I, even as I started reading it, something just felt almost like pulling to my soul as I was reading it. And the story for me started sounding familiar as if something, you know, I'd heard before, but you know, I've watched a lot of slave, his, historical slave, um, books and movies and so on. And so, you know, you kind of more or less hear a lot of very similar stories. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reading the book and I'm reading the book. And um, as I'm reading, and it's probably two o'clock in the morning um, towards the end of the book. And I needed to finish this book. It was two o'clock in the morning and I I had lab starting at 7 a.m. in the morning, but I needed to finish this book. (laughs) I find my um, uh, four times great grandfather's name. So Thomas Peters. Oh, and in the book, in the book, in the book, right, right, in oh. the book. So he was one of the characters in the book. And it was interesting because the whole time I'd been reading the book, I was like, oh, I remember hearing stories like this too from um, my great grandmother. Um, she, uh, I was very fortunate to have her in my life until she uh, passed away at age 98. And wow. she used to tell us stories all the time. And then to my aunt's, um, And my mom too, she was, um, you know, very always, you know, wanting to share with me stories about our ancestry, about our history. And so, you know, when you're growing up, when you're a teenager, you hear these things, but you know, they're in the back of your mind, but you don't really listen to them and you don't fully hear them, but they're sitting there with you. And so when I was reading the book, it's almost like it triggered something in the back of my mind of this Mm. is familiar. This is this sounds so familiar. And when I saw my, my great grandfather's name in the book, I was like, no way. And then I did a little bit of history, a, a little bit of uh, background mm-hmm. uh, research on the book as well. And what I had discovered was that um, my great grandfather, Thomas Peters, who was actually a, a loyalist, I had heard his story of being captured um, in Africa uh, as a slave, in West Africa as a slave, um, and being brought over to a farm in Virginia, him having escaped, going to New York, fighting with the British um, against the South, you know, uh, winning his freedom, and then making it back to to Canada, making it to Canada, actually, um, and kind of going to Nova Scotia area. I remember hearing as well that he had made it all the way back to Africa. So he'd made it back to the motherland. And three gener- four generations later, I was born from him. Oh my and gosh. And so I'd heard that story orally from my mom, from my great grandmother, and it's, oh. it's in our family. And so when I was reading the book, it's like it all just came together and seeing his name there um, just almost solidified it for me. So I did a lot more research and um, his name is actually in, um, there's a lot of British um military documents with Mm -hmm. his name in it showing that he'd fought with the British 
to win his freedom. Also how he had fought as a black loyalist in Nova Scotia to be able to go back to Africa and had made the trip back. There's a wow. lot of sort of contradictory things too about his past. Um, you know, uh, I'm still kind of diving a little deeper into that, right. but it was very, for me, just interesting how um, it was almost like a, a, a really just a self-discovery of a, this is me, who am I? Yes. Um, because it allowed me to see sort of a path, how he had taken this path as a slave and made it back to the motherland. And here I was as an immigrant, you know, making this very similar journey. I had came up through... Um, uh, the U.S. I lived in the U.S. and was actually recruited from South Africa to play basketball and to do my undergrad in the States yeah. and then made my way up to Canada um, as well and now kind of established and living here in Canada. But it's like I made very similar um, path that he did. Yes. And knowing that, seeing that, putting it together, putting together the oral history that I'd heard of and then hearing as well that um, Lawrence Hill actually did base a lot of the book too on my great grandfather's life wow. um, as the path as well was just life-changing for me. Yeah. I just love that so much because it's rare, you know, on my, on my mom's side, my mom, uh, Trinidadian and, you know, so the transatlantic slave trade, you know, um, uh, is in our family lineage, but, um, you know, for most of us, we are not able to trace our, our great grandparents because of slavery, but because, um, like his trajectory is amazing, right? Like just being captured as a slave, then like this story of resistance, right? Then slave in Virginia, then fighting and fighting and then gaining his freedom and then going back to Africa and then you being born. Did he come in through South Africa or or is it Liberia? Because I know in the night in the Nova Scotia, so Senegal. Folks, yes, okay, they okay. went. To, so they went to Senegal. There's actually a street named after him there. Wow. And, yeah, and there's like a monument as well to him. And so he made his way there, and his family settled there. And then my great grandfather, so he is, uh, I guess, two times uh, great grandson, um, left Senegal, uh, jumped a ship actually, and then uh, kind of you know sold his way onto a ship made it all the way down to South Africa, um, jumped off at Cape Town, which is where, I, where I'm from, and then met my great-grandmother, who is Japanese. Wow. Um, <laughs> so that's sort of also the start of my, my big mixed heritage. Yes. Okay. So, so just very, very cool story. And then, I mean, you're working in equity, diversity, and inclusion, which, you know, some people say just EDI, but for a lot of my colleagues in the States, they call, actually call it JEDI, like justice, equity, and uh, diversity and inclusion, but nonetheless has that essence of like justice in there, which, I mean, uh, your great, great, great grandfather, your ancestor, um, you know, was a, a, a resistor, right? So I think that's not only did you make the journey, but it seems you have embodied the spirit. Um, yes. now, um, that also is not, I'm guessing by accident of having a deep understanding of racism, things like that, because you grew up in apartheid South Africa, right? Um, so do you want to kind of, um, walk us through that? Like how old were you at the time that apartheid ended? Like how, and then the legacy, I mean, still lives on. It's not like a poof, it disappeared. So maybe you do want to tell us about, I guess, Again, let's think about our, our, our listeners. Let's do the 101. What is um, apartheid? When did it take place in South Africa? And when were you born in that, you know, historical moment? Yeah, absolutely. And so South Africa's history. Um, so the apartheid laws came in around the 1940s. It was actually adopted from the Indian Act. And so the, the Indian South Act here in Canada, Turtle in Canada, Island, the Canadians yes. who think they're so multicultural. Yes, yes, they adapted it from the Indian Act. Sorry, from the I Indian just wanted Act. to emphasize, but please go Absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is too, I mean, you know, for me, helps me to understand so much of what is happening in Canada as well. And, you know, looking at this work, um, EDI from a Canadian perspective too, it makes a lot of sense to me. Pause. Let's just take a moment to dive into the history of the Indian Act and its connection to South African apartheid. First, let's talk about apartheid. It was a form of legislated segregation in South Africa from 1948 to 1994, in which Black people and people from other racialized groups did not have the same political and economic rights as white people and were forced to live separately from white people. There was also a hierarchy among racialized groups such that the Black people, also referred to as the indigenous African population, 
had the least rights. This type of structure may sound vaguely familiar to Canadians when we think about how Indigenous people have been treated here. This is not a coincidence. There is a real connection between the two. In the early 1900s, South African officials regularly came to Canada for inspiration on how to oppress Indigenous African people. The South African officials came here to observe and marvel at how white settlers in Canada oppressed the Indigenous people in North America. For instance, the original version of Canada's Indian Act from 1876 combined a number of colonial laws that aimed to eliminate First Nations culture in favor of assimilation into Euro-Canadian society. One aspect of the Indian Act that South African officials observed was the past system, which criminalized the movement of Indigenous people in Canada. This inspired the past system in South Africa, which was also used to criminalize the movement of people who were Indigenous to South Africa, the Black people. So Canada's cruelty and dehumanization of Indigenous people was a model for designing South African apartheid. That's why it feels familiar. So the apartheid laws came in around the 1940s. It was actually adopted from the Indian Act. And so the, the Indian South Act African, here in Canada, Turtle in Canada, Island, the Canadians yes. who think they're so multicultural. Yes, yes, they adopted it from the Indian Act. Sorry, from the I just Act. wanted to emphasize, but please go absolutely. ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. Which is too, I mean, you know, for me, helps me to understand so much of what is happening in Canada as well. And, you mm-hmm. know, looking at this work, um, EDI, from a Canadian perspective too, it makes a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was, you know, uh, it was a, a segregation, a system of segregation um, that we adopted through that. And South Africa was a little interesting as well in that it's... Um, Racial divide uh, was a little different than than you would see um, in many other countries in that instead of being divided into two races, we were divided into three. Mm. And so we were black, white and colored. Colored was essentially, which is what my heritage is. Um, I'm indigenous black mixed with European or um, as in my case as well, um, East Asian. And so basically what it, what what had happened in history in South Africa was that especially Cape Town, my city that I'm from, mm-hmm. um, it's the very most southern tip of Africa. Yes. And it became a refreshment station for the Europeans who would sail around the Horn of Africa to get to the east. So they would be going to India, going to East Asia. They didn't want to go through the land, um, through the Middle East, because they would encounter a lot of conflict there. And it was hard traveling across land. So they made their way around Africa, actually, to get to India, to get you know spices and materials and things mm-hmm. like that. And so what they would do is they would stop in Cape Town Mm. and the European men and sailors would get off. And a lot of them actually ended up settling in Cape Town and they would um, get together with the local indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And so essentially my background became, we became a, um, uh, you know, multi through generations, but Mm -hmm. multi-generations of mixed kids who oftentimes spoke the European language. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but of course we didn't identify as white, so we were Mm. still of color. So we held a certain level of privilege as colored people Mm. um, uh, compared to indigenous black people. And so when the apartheid laws were, you know, implemented in South Africa in the 1940s, um, they divided us into exactly that. So we became three classes of a society. Mm -hmm. We became, you know, white as superior, colored as in the middle, and then black indigenous people as um, on the bottom. And so you would see in the social system of our country as well, if you were, say, for example, applying for a job, all of the CEO managers, you know, lead positions in organizations would be white people. Mm -hmm. The secretaries, um, at administrative staff would be colored people and then the janitorial staff or you know kind of the cleaning staff or the tea ladies would be 
the black, indigenous black people. Um, and so, you know, in that way, our society was really structured in that way. And so we geographically were divided in that way. So I grew up amongst only colored people. So, you know, in elementary school, all of my friends were colored. I was surrounded wow. by my family who were all colored. We were all mixed. And so we interbred amongst ourselves, if you can call it that, because we were no, also no, put into yeah. this geographical setting. And so my culture and heritage, we, um, as colored people, we, we're on a huge spectrum. So I have cousins with red hair, green eyes and white skin. And mm-hmm. then I have, you know, my uncle who is, um, you know, really dark skin who looks like my husband who is Congolese. Right. Um, right. you know, and so you, you have this sort of spectrum of people, um, because of how we sort of intermix and what creates our culture specifically as colored people was, our language. So we often, we, we often, we spoke the white man's language. So we spoke English or Afrikaans or a mix of the two that we actually created in our own as well. Um, we, and Afrikaans is from the Dutch, right? The the main colonizers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's Dutch. Um, so Afrikaans is a form of Dutch. Um, and then, yeah, we were never allowed to learn any indigenous black languages, um, as the apartheid system would be. And so we were segregated in those ways, um, in schools, like I said, in school, I, I went to school with people who only, you know, were mixed people, um, mm-hmm. Carlin people, um, and lived in neighborhoods like that. And so my first exposure, um, when I would say the early nineties, I was probably in elementary school when we started seeing the shift happening, uh, legally. Mm -hmm. Um, but what we also started seeing is that at our colored schools, we started having, um, black students from black areas come to our schools. Right. So this is after Nelson Mandela and 19 is 1993, 93, 93, right. 93. So this was actually shortly before that. So I would say this is like probably 1990. So about two to three years just before he came out, things started shifting, but okay. started shifting in the way that like in my classroom, in my grade of maybe five or six classes, we had three black kids, you know, three indigenous black kids that were right. coming to our school. Right. Mm. So it wasn't a very big number. Right. Um, and, uh, and so similarly, when I was 13, which is when Nelson Mandela was released and when the laws officially ended, when apartheid officially ended, I ended up going to a white school where I was a minority. Mm. And so for my high school years, I spent um, all of my high school years at a private German school. I was able to write an exam, you know, um, Mm. they do sort of testing and then you get in and then you kind of get a scholarship as well. And so I was very fortunate enough as well to be able to to get that education. But our educational system was divided in that way as well. And so, you know, upward mobility for education, geographically where you were living and in every way your life. I mean, when we went to the beaches, Mm -hmm. you know, there'd be beaches that say whites only or coloreds, um, coloreds and blacks, or, you know, sometimes we would mix and sometimes we would even be divided amongst ourselves as well in that way. I think so. I mean, I can't imagine growing up like where it's formal, right? Like certainly there's light skin privilege or whatever in a number of different countries and there's colorism, but where it's like legalized, do you know what I mean? Like what you're allowed to do, how much education, what schools you can go to based on skin tone, not just race, or it turned into a separate race is mind blowing to me that, you know, even up until 1993, I think, you know, for those who are Canadian listening to it, I guess your, um, uh, the colored group might be most analogous maybe to the Métis, right? Where there's yes. kind of indigenous and, and white yes. mixture, but... Also ma- mulatto, like or amongst mul- the right. French, mulatto. As mulatto in the French, term. okay. Exactly. But for it to be a formal class, a formal race is... So I know a lot of people have, you know, watched Trevor Noah's show and he talked about it's only when he came to the United States, did he become black, right? Because in South Africa, not only was his existence illegal because black and uh, white people were not allowed to like marry or have children during, you know, um, apartheid, but also he was, he's, he's not considered black in South Africa because he's, he's biracial. And it makes me think about the fact of how, and I use him as an example in my teachings because it's such a social construct, the idea of race, right? And it's geopolitical in the United States and in Canada, um, particularly the United States where white people were the majority, um, and, you know, you had African slaves, they use the one drop rule, right? So if you have any ounce of black in you, even if you don't look black, you're black, because then they can extract more 
capital from you, right? Like you you can um, work for less and be lesser valued. In South Africa, where the white people were the very, very tiny minority, they created, a, you know, another class right under them, <laughs> right? To just yes. plump up things a little bit. Um, because the Black, Indigenous, African, Indigenous people were the vast majority, I think like 90%, right? So you have this colored class, but it's an actual race as opposed to here where, you know, you could say somebody's biracial, but this is like a different census tract. Like this is entirely separate. Um, and you really weren't allowed to cross those those lines, right? Like you could be arrested, you could be um, and even when you're arrested, I, I you know, I went to where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned, even in prison, like, first of all, white people weren't in the same jail, but for the activists, you know, a, a colored person was able to receive, I think, you know, bread, but a an African person would receive pap. A colored person prisoner is allowed to have pants, but the African would only be allowed shorts as their uniforms. Like everything down to like prisoners' yeah. meals and and clothing was about are you black versus colored. Um yes. and so what was that like for you? You said, you know, there was a there was a time when there were three black kids that came in the class. Did you identify with them or did you see them as other? And how did that contrast similar to Trevor Noah when you moved to the United States? So maybe if you could talk about yeah. those two and contrast them, those experiences. Yeah, for sure. So the, you know, the experience of um, black kids coming into our school, they were very much othered. Mm -hmm. um by us and it's 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 an interesting concept because it's very you know i i i try to explain to people to even for myself and my husband in south africa we're considered a mixed couple mm. so i it wasn't until i moved to the u.s that i was called black for the first time right um and, and your features look black life. in a you know north america like it's, normal because people can't see yes, so it's not like a exactly. mariah carey ambiguous kind of situation yeah, so like you yeah, have there's African no confusion features. yeah yeah you're light absolutely features. Yeah. yes there's no confusion about my race if you saw me as a north american um in south africa though because um because we was, you know, as, and, and this is how, you know, systems of white supremacy and anti-blackness mm. um, is so, you know, it's, it, it's just, it, it's so deep. It runs so deep that it even tells us um, that our own blackness needs to be denied. Mm. And that's what it did to us as colored people. It made us separate from black people so that we were, you know, we became also a group where we were like, well, we're not getting treated as badly as them. Mm. So therefore white people are our friend. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it internalized so much of that white supremacy for ourselves as well. Yes, right. Yes. And so, you know, in South Africa too, to be called black was like, as a colored person was like the most insulting thing for me, mm. you know, growing up mm -hmm. um, because that's what we were taught. You are not black and you want to avoid being black as mm -hmm. much as you can. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, my, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I was dating, I was a teenager around the mm -hmm. time apartheid ended. So, you know, getting on the dating scene as a 13, 14, 15 year old, can you imagine how confusing that is now too? Right. It's like, you know, society tells you date like this or don't date like this. And, uh -huh. um, you know, there's this, you know, um, don't, you know, don't bring home an African man. It's okay to bring home a white man or a colored man, you know, wow. that was sort of what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Um, and so even for myself and my husband, we've been together since we were 18. So, you know, dating during that time as well. It was newer in those years as well for mm -hmm. the interracial couples to be married. Um, and he's dark skin and, black. He's like he's dark skin black. He is Congolese through. Yeah, yeah, yes, right. yeah. One hundred. Yes, yes. one hundred. <laughs> he is Lingala through and through. <laughs> yeah. So right. so it's you know so so for us um, it was was very interesting navigating that and so it also allowed me to decide, like I had to decide my own identity, mm. right? Of who I am, what I value, what is skin color to me? What is culture to me as well? Mm. And, you know, um, choosing to be with someone who is not of my culture and that I know, you know, people in my own family are uncomfortable with, right? Is, is, it was very interesting. And to describe that to people here in North America, when here it's just black and white, oftentimes people who are interracial, they'll have that. To explain that even as a mixed person with a black person, like that's what it's like in South Africa. That shows you how contextual racism yes. is, how contextual colonization is, how contextual too um, anti-blackness is. Yes. Um, and so, you know, moving over to North America was interesting. Um, 
it was um, a very new experience for me of, to be honest, really discovering my blackness. Mm. Um, Like I said, I'd never been called black before. And so, you know, coming to North America and, you know, finding who I am as a black woman was um, something new I had to come into. But then too, I was in Tennessee. So I lived, Ooh. you know, my first experience of North America the, was Tennessee. The south. You down south, this, girl? girl, I was down south. Wow. And so that mm. was a, another very different experience <laughs> as yeah. well. And, you know, African-American people in the South is very different from African-American people, even in the North Mm -hmm. and even in Canada. Right. right? right. And so being within that context of um, now, you know, discovering African-American culture, but Southern African-American culture again, too, um, and the complexities of that. So I was, because this was around 2001 when I arrived and, you know, getting the questions of, oh, did you live in a hut? Oh, do you have lions <laughs> running around? And, you know, did you live, you know, did right. you climb trees? And did you, you know, d- is this your first time really wearing shoes all the time? Wow. You know, getting right. those questions in college. Like I was, in co- I was a freshman in college. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Um, again, too, was, was, was a huge shock to the system. And then getting that from African-Americans for me was surprising because right. I, you know, you, we watch TV, right? For, in yeah. South Africa, we watch, we see seen you know, African-Americans on TV. And to us, we're thinking they're always talking about the motherland, this, the motherland, that, but it made me realize how even African-Americans don't fully understand the African experience um, or or blackness in Africa. Colonization and anti-blackness, we internalize it, right? Um, And we're taught that, you know, Africans are, you know, primitive and less intelligent and all of that, right? It's, this, I guess the same things that you learned as a colored person is like, you don't want Absolutely. to be African, right? That's what yeah. we're, we're taught over and over. And I saw that. I experienced a lot of that. And what was that like for you? Because I mean, even as you say, you say you now you're embodying as a black woman, but I mean, that is a label and then that, you know what I mean? That has a fluidity yes. to it. Absolutely. Um, but for you, is it more as thinking about your indigenous Africanness, or do you see it more as an African-American perspective? Like, how do you, I guess, self-identify now? How have you uh, processed uh, that? That's a very, very interesting way to ask. (laughs) And something I've been um, kind of asking of myself, it's been a journey, to be Mm -hmm. honest, because also within a Canadian context, that experience is very different. So I lived in the States. So I, I, I moved to the States when I was 21. So as you can imagine, 21 is also, it's, you know, it's pretty young. You're also still discovering yourself. Mm -hmm. Then I discover myself in, in, you know, in the South and as a black woman, and I'm sort of discovering that. And I'm also realizing I'm different Mm -hmm. in the sense that I'm not African-American right? and, you know, learning African-American culture. So I am African and I kind of really held that. Um, What I felt was when I moved to Canada though, so I've been in Canada um, since 2009 is that, you know, from a Canadian perspective, I was really able to hold on to my Africanness. Mm-hmm. Yes, and yes. I really embodied that indigenous, you know, African identity um, that I didn't even know I was missing. Ah. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't think I was able to do that necessarily in the States mm-hmm, where, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it, granted, it was my 20s. I'm trying to assimilate. I'm trying to fit right, in. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. You're trying to fit That's in. So fit in, yeah. you, you're changing your identity to what's around you. I think when I moved to Canada, I was a little bit older um, and it was a space, again, Canadian context. Everybody's proud of where they come from. Everybody's mm-hmm. proud of their heritage. Yes. And so I felt like it was a space where I could really actually, okay, I am an African woman in Canada. Right. And so right. I am both Canadian and I'm African and mm-hmm. I can be both. And they're two parts of my identity and they can live together here with me. I right. don't have to assimilate. I don't have to conform, um, you know, and I can live with both of them. Now that, that is A really cool, you know, like how you went through that journey. Um, So as you know, um, you introduced me to your aunt, uh, Caroline. And uh, so she still lives in South Africa and does amazing work on gender-based violence. So she's, you know, a strong activist. And I thought it was interesting because, again, in your family, and I met other members of your family, you know, in your family, you you grew up, uh, as you mentioned, with the identity of being colored. But your aunt, Caroline, um, who, again, still lives in South Africa, um, uh, self-identifies as Black. Yes. Um, can you can you speak to that? I mean, if, obviously people will hear that interview, but I guess you kind of watching that process and her d- 
did you see that uh, metamorphosis or was that always the case? Like, what's your perspective on, you know, I, being a colored person identifying as Black in South Africa? Yes. So my family was a little bit different. I come from, you know, it's it's funny. They say it's in your DNA. It's really in my DNA. Like, literally, <laughs> I'm, I am, you know, the... Um, uh, I am, um, you know, a child of a black loyalist mm -hmm. and, you know, so in my family and in my, 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 the way my family is, we've always been, I've always kind of been raised, um, in a way to, to fight oppression, to fight injustices, mm -hmm. to understand that the system that we were living in South Africa was not okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and my, gr my grandfather, um, that I grew up with my grandfather on my mom's side, he too was a politician. He was, you know, very much, um, part of the resistance and part of the fight as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I grew up in that too. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my aunts on my mom's side, especially, um, and family on my mom's side, um, have all, we've always had that in us that there's something wrong here. There's right. something not okay with the system. Mm -hmm. Um, that this is, you know, there's, there's something better than this mm -hmm. that they're telling us, yes. um, in this society that we're living in. And so I grew up with that. And I know my aunts as well grew up like that in my grandfather's household. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's, it's definitely been, um, you know, I've, I've seen this, um, transformation in my country with colored people uh. where a lot of colored people are figuring out that it is okay to be black and that we actually are black. Mm. And so, you know, which is something we were told before you never say, you never try to become, you know, we've always been told that. But now with, you know, the change, the transition in the country, when, you know, Nelson Mandela became president, when black power became, you know, an effort that everybody rallied behind in the country as well, you know, economically, you know, land back, you know, we're, we're doing so much of that in the country as well, that, you know, even colored people started realizing, oh, we've been lied to, you mm. know, about who we are. And so we need to rediscover for ourselves who and what we are. And I think a lot of us, especially in my family too, are really um, pulled to our heritage, our, our, our black heritage that we knew has always been there, mm -hmm. but we never got to embrace. Pause. Performing whiteness is a hell of a thing for BIPOC folks in mainstream workplaces. In our very first episode of Race, Health, and Happiness, EDI expert Ritu Basin spoke about the tension racialized folks experience and having to be what she called the performative self rather than the authentic self, which she writes about in her book, The Authenticity Principle. And it's not a phenomenon that she invented. There is quite a bit of literature on this. Many BIPOC professionals feel pressure to conform to Eurocentric values and norms in a way that feels fake and creates stress. Racialized employees are often expected to embody whiteness as a universal standard of professionalism. Scholars such as Nguyen and Duran note that participating in whiteness can be emotionally taxing for people of color because it upholds white supremacy and places us as other. I think we all kind of know this, but we can get caught up in it and not realize how draining it is before it's too late. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you need to be working in a racially toxic environment, be intentional about it and make sure you have your gas mask on. And what do I mean by your gas mask? I mean the intentional protective practices like meditation, peer support, community support, or even community resistance so you can stay well. Because I don't want you to just survive. I want you to sur thrive. <laughs> Thank you. 
And so we need to rediscover for ourselves who and what we are. And I think a lot of us, especially in my family too, are really um, pulled to our heritage, our, our, our black heritage that mm. we knew has always been there, mm -hmm. but we never got to embrace. Uh, and I know that too, with okay. my aunt too, this is, this has been her journey where she's, you know, to her, she is black. She identifies as black. She very much identifies too with that um, black indigenous culture that um, she's been able to rediscover in so many ways. Um, I know with lots of my aunts and uncles too, on that side of the family, my mom has 11 siblings. And so, you know, a lot of them have truly, you know, all the many years have uh, developed their identities or redeveloped or redefined mm -hmm. their identities, I think, in blackness and in discovering this blackness. And so I think that's the journey for her as well, which interestingly enough, I never had that journey in South Africa. I got to have it in a North American context, mm -hmm. which makes it a little different for me. But I think it's it, it, it's all part of anti-racism. It's all part right. of decolonization. We are decolonizing ourselves mm -hmm. as individuals. We're decolonizing our identities and rebuilding you know, who we are from understanding our ancestry and embracing that and saying we are that and we want to embody it and live it now. That's that's amazing. Um, and yeah, I mean, folks will listen to, to you know, my interview with, um, with your aunt, but my goodness, she just kind of like really, oh my goodness, uh, uh, inspired me. Um, she's a very, she, she's a very powerful she woman. Um, and the things that she has done to advance other, uh, you know, um, the lives of other women, especially in the context of gender-based violence. Yeah. Um, now, one of the other guests that I interviewed while I was in South Africa, so he was a freedom fighter and he now works in EDI and education um, in in South Africa, right? So I find it interesting that you uh, also work. Now, it, I don't want to be like, yes. oh, and I know somebody from South Africa. Do you know the person? It's not like that. But I find it interesting that you both work in EDI. And I can't help wondering if growing up, you know, in apartheid, like where this, again, like there is anti-Black racism here in North America, but the era of the signs being there, like Blacks can only go through this way and whites that way for us are in the history books, right? Um, whereas, you know, you folks are like living and breathing and lived in that, steeped in that of where you can go, where you can't go, and how violent you'll be treated if you don't follow those rules. Do you think that influenced you to kind of work at this intersection of EDI and research? Because certainly my experiences of racism influenced me to, you know, work um, in anti-racism. But I'm wondering for, for, for you and what you think for certain people um, uh, uh, who lived during that time, right, of, of, of the apartheid era. Absolutely. And this is why we, you know, we talk about lived experience being so important to this work. Mm. Um, because, you know, a lot of the work that we're trying to do in EDI as well is to help people be able to empathize, be able to understand people's lived experiences. And oftentimes, again, not oftentimes, always, you will never fully understand what that is like unless you've lived it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we do our best to try to help people understand so that they can do better and know to do better mm -hmm. um, for EDI in their workplace or, you know, in their occupations or where or in the organization, wherever it may be. Yeah. But I think, you know, for us who have really lived that, who fully understand how um, in your face racism can be, yeah. how, you know, this, you know, the, the, you know, the sense of, yes, you are allowed to be here. You see this sign, don't step over that line or, you know, watching, like standing in a long line. This was one of the other things too, was in South Africa, you know, growing up, one of my, my, um, my, my, my biggest memories, you know, I was probably about five or six years old, but it is so vivid, you know, when you have one of those vivid memories mm -hmm. in your mind, but I was five or six years old. And I remember um, standing on the, the, the train station waiting for a train with my parents and we were going to the beach for the day mm -hmm. and the train comes along and, you know, where we're standing, it's really packed and the train comes along and um, the class is, and the, the train is there and it's third class. And, um, you know, the train is packed and I look down the line and there's like, you know, um, uh, you know, more carts down the line that are completely empty. And so, you know, I turned to my dad and I said, why can't we go sit there? Why must we squeeze into this one? And my dad said, well, that's for white people only. We have to go in here. Wow. And that was one of the most, you know, um, 
vivid memories, almost the feelings of squishing into that train, yes. holding my dad's hand really tightly because mm-hmm. I would get lost if I didn't, um, you know, was, was again, one of the most vivid memories for me of fully understanding this is segregation, this is racism at work. And, you know, having experienced that and then coming to North America where, again, we're like, oh, but this is, you know, the land of opportunity. This is the land of right. no racism of, you know, it's free of oppression. It's, you know, mm-hmm. I left that behind in South Africa, but then seeing it so clearly in, you know, systems and structures that exist here for me yes. was just, you know, I've seen the extreme and yet, wow, it still lingers. Oh, it's yeah. still here and it's still so alive and, and kicking. still very much alive and keeping kicking and keeping people who look like me from being able to fully just live it our lives. And you know, this, you know, your podcast is about happiness. And it's interesting because we are even limited in our happiness. Yes. Because of those systems and structures that still exist today that I see that are a reflection of the segregation I experienced here within a Canadian context, in an American context as well. Yeah, I think part of it is like, it's it's so, I mean, I look at it as a physician, clinician or whatever, but it feels like a delusion. You know, like there are people who have yes. conditions and they'll say like, you know, um, the example they would give us sometimes in medical school of, of certain types of delusions that you can't treat really is like, you know, a person is perfectly functional, but believes that Jesus lives in their liver, right? And so unless you have that conversation with them, they're a perfectly functioning librarian until they're like, yeah, but Jesus lives in my liver, right? That would be yeah. the example they would give us. But it feels like the concept of race is this delusion, but actually does cause harm of us internalizing beliefs. And the structures are still there, the the hierarchy of what you just said, right? The CEO, the middle level, and those who are cleaning, you walk into a hospital, right? That's it's my right world. There. It's right there. It's but right it's not there. legislated. No. It's just in our, our policies and our practices and still comes from that legacy of colonization uh, and, and structural racism. And particularly at the bottom of that hierarchy in almost any country you go, the opposite of whiteness is blackness. So that's the melanin spectrum. And so we see that, right? And then and then the need to dehumanize the indigenous folks so that you can take land. So those patterns Although they'll be contextual, it's the it's the same it's the same playbook, right? It's very much the same. Now, for many of us, like when I was growing up, so you know, when I, in elementary school, I would come with the African National Congress flag and crayon, right? I'd put it in crayon because I was experiencing racism, and I would say, "This is Nelson Mandela, and we need to end apartheid, and and you know, um, and and what racism is." And I used that right to to understand things, and certainly. What's happening in South Africa is very inspiring because we see change in our in our own real time. But while I was in South Africa, um, first of all, the legacy of apartheid is still there. So even what I talked about in the hospitals, I went to a conference and we were having the exact same conversations. It's not like all of the people, like there might be affirmative action things, but not understanding that the Black students don't get the mentorship they need, don't get the, you know what I mean? Those types of, they're kind of just put there like, okay, sink or swim like they would have in the United States in the 1960s. So what do you think about the the legacy of um, apartheid today? And also, maybe you can speak briefly also about, for me, it was a bit of a sadness about the dream because and when I was a kid, you know, of course I didn't go out and protest, but I had my little crayon flag. There was a dream of how South Africa could be, um, especially with an African ruling p- party, right? But now that Nelson Mandela has gone, there's been a lot of critique, which is expected. But some of it, you know, there's been some yes. some money moving around in strange ways. So yes. <laughs> maybe to to speak about how power has worked or how things have worked in South Africa, today's South Africa. South Africa. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that um, for me that I, the lens that I look at our situation in the country through Mm -hmm. is this lens that colonization stole from us, not only land Mm -hmm. and culture, but it stole from us understanding how to live. Mm -hmm. And it stole from us how understanding how we live and how we should live. Mm -hmm. It told us the European way to live is the right way to live. Right. Yes. And so, you know, when you do that to a people, they forget who they are. They forget their stories, our oral histories. We forget that. We forget how our people used to live. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that what, what we're, you know, in African countries, what oftentimes what we're trying to do is we're trying to Africanize a European society. Mm. Right. Yes. And try to do that. Th- those two things are in conflict. Colonization yes. and decolonization are in conflict. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. And so, you know, with African countries, what we have to understand is that we're, we're telling African countries to operate in a way we've given you the rules of how to live. Now you live by it. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Like we're still being told to live by the European rules and the European ways of doing things, which is profit over people. Right. You, yes. I'm sure you're familiar and you've probably heard our concept of Ubuntu. Right. Yes. I am because, because we are. We are. Which is right? such a humanistic, beautiful concept it, from the Zulu. So I believe. beautiful. Yes, yes. From the Zulu. And it's something that is, you know, it, it was ours but it's been stolen from us. And so when you see a lot of the, um, the corruption, the, the issues that our country is having is because we've lost Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to live by Ubuntu anymore because European society taught us, you know, survival of the fittest, get everything you can today. Don't think about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Whereas Ubuntu is literally the opposite. We're always thinking about our people for tomorrow. We're always thinking about how it, what I'm doing is impacting those around me and vice versa. And it is a relationship. We've lost all of that. And so we're running our countries, you know, democratically in this way that, you know, with people who are trying to do it in an African way, but being pushed, forced into a European model Mm -hmm. and we're lost. We're just Mm -hmm. lost. And so I, you know, that's really what I see the issues are with Af- with a lot of the African countries is that we as African people have lost and we don't understand who we are anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, as, as, you know, colonization, hundreds of years, it, right. yeah. you know, of, of colonization that we're yes. trying to overcome now. This was 1993 that apartheid Ex- ended. Thank you. Now exactly. all of a sudden we're supposed to, you know, overnight change into the successful thriving country, mm-hmm. you know, run by black people who were never told how to run a country. Of course, you're going to have this. Of course, this is going to happen. Um, you know, and so of course, you're going to see, you know, we're going to go through these labor pains, yeah. you know, to now birth this new Africa that is oh, ours. I love it. I love that. That, analogy. you know, that is ours. Mama that belongs Africa. To yes. us. Mama Africa, right? Yes. And so we're going through growing pains. And I think that's what Africa is going through. We're going through growing pains. I am hopeful though. So I, um, you know, and as you know, I, I, I recently bought property in South Africa. I, I, I'm feeling drawn yes. back in many ways and in many aspects. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I see my generation who have been educated, uh, you know, both in South Africa and outside of South Africa, a lot of, you know, my friends that I grew up with who are black and, and colored, you know, um, I have hope for that generation eventually mm-hmm. taking over leadership there and fixing a lot of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, it might, you know, hopefully ours and the next generation, I'm even more hopeful yeah. We'll do even better um, because I think we see it. We we love our country, South Africa, you know, and I know for many other African countries too, you know, especially expats who have, you know, are going back. A lot of us are going back and investing back into, into Africa and Beautiful. buying land, yes, taking land yes. back and, and, and holding that. But it's going to, again, you know, hundreds, um, you know, centuries of colonization. Is, we're not going to overcome it in, you know, one decade or two decades or three decades, whatever it may be now. No, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I absolutely agree. Um, It's so important for us to know our history. Like if you look at some of the texts just shortly after slavery ended in the United States or or the newspapers, you know, or even uh, judge rulings, like it's like, well, slavery ended 20 years ago. What's your problem, right? It would literally be like, why aren't the black people thriving, like it's been 20 years, like the way they say like 20, yeah. you know, the way they write it, like 20 whole years, what's the problem, right? Yeah. And then you look back at that and say, oh my goodness, like this is centuries later. And it, it's like unpacking all of that is still so heavy. And the wealth and privilege of those who benefited from those systems is so intense and so, violent yeah that how can you expect anything like that within a short amount of time? Just the expectation in itself is racist and colonial to not remember, right? Colonialism always has us forgetting to not not remember all of the violence 
that African countries, particularly South Africa, has been through, it is going to take time to to heal. But I like the way you put it in this uh, the 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 labor pains, and I think yes. that has a an, an entirely different connotation of hope that I I want to thank you for these labor pains that Africa as a whole in South Africa are going through but my goodness when we birth that you know decolonial future um oh my goodness right yes. uh it's a beautiful thing it is it it is a beautiful thing and you know I'm hopeful I'm you know I have two boys that that are you know born here um in North mm-hmm. America and um, I'm, you know, they they both have dual citizenship, South African mm. citizenship as well. And, you know, I am teaching them as well about South Africa. We go back pretty often to we've been very fortunate and very blessed to be able to do that. That's and amazing. so they're very well connected. They feel roots. They see roots, yeah. you know, um, and I think that that is also so important for us as, you know, even as black people living here in a North American context, I, I see so much of that, um, the trauma of losing roots mm-hmm. being so much the reason for a lot of the issues that still exist in a lot of our um our communities yes you know we've lost that and and, and that's the idea of colonization remove yes. them from their roots yes. make them not know where it is that they came from what nourished them previously and yes. we give them and tell them who and what they are which is totally not who and what they are and so it's yes. you know in re and making sure that you're finding those roots that you're understanding those roots as well of who you are, what defines you as well, because we are our ancestors. Yes. Yes. I love that. We are our ancestors. And my dear, you certainly are uh, your ancestor (laughs) Uh, in particular ancestors, but in particular, particularly famous one. Um, Now with all of that, with our ancestors, yes, our ancestors had struggle, but they also had community. They also had joy. So For this podcast, I always ask because it is so important. It is our birthright, joy. Uh, Nicole, what brings you joy? Ah, exactly that community, family, you know, um, it's the space I get to be who I truly am. You know, Mm. this world, you know, this is the reality of living in, um, in a Canadian context, in a North American context. We live in a white world Mm. and there's a lot that we you know, a lot that we, of who we are, that we can't always bring to those spaces Mm -hmm. where we have to be in order to be able to function there. We oftentimes have to change who we are, placate and, you know, make others around us feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's hard. It's exhausting. It is, you know, just, it, it wears on your soul. And so for me, what is, you know, what fills my cup and what, you know, kind of recuperates me to be able to go out there on a daily basis, you know, as I do in this work, especially, Mm -hmm. um, is family and what I do outside of the work. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for black people, I feel like, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, we, I, I'm part of, you know, um, mentorship groups and so on. And what I, uh, you know, and a lot of the mentees that I work with, you know, a lot of them, they'll be like, but how do you do it? How do you endure this work? I say, find your joy outside of it. Yes. Because the reality is, you know, you're going to have little wins in this work, you know, and it'll be great. You'll ha- find some successes, but don't let that define your joy and your happiness. Go outside and find your community. Find, you know, for me, one of the things is um, five o'clock Fridays. I have this thing called <laughs> five o'clock Fridays uh-huh. where at five o'clock I will put on music really loud. You know, it's, it's where I end my work week. You know, I, I, I make a, a cocktail. I find a new cocktail to make every Friday and I <laughs> dance and I enjoy my cocktail. And that's, you know, that's where I, I fill a bit of my cup to be able to get ready for my weekend with my family. You know, oh my goodness. Um, and family activities. And so you find those things outside of um, those spaces that you, you, you don't feel like you can be yourself to be yourself. We need that. Those, you know, those spaces are so important to find the people that we can authentically be ourselves with. Oh, I love that that visual. Girl, I am like, I need to tell my kids they need to watch out now because I'm about to have me a five o'clock Friday. <laughs> <Crazy>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love it. Thank you for, for sharing. I love the image. I love the practice. But thank you for sharing your experiences, your rich family history. Wow. Um, and telling us a little bit about South Africa as we embark on uh, the series that we're going to have um, uh, with these folks who have done such work disrupting apartheid, uh, colonialism, and uh, and and structural racism in South Africa. So thank you very much, Nicole. And thank you for your work for disrupting those structures here in Canada. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for um, doing this work, you know, for South Africa. I know it's, it's going to be so impactful as well. So thank you so much for all you do, Dr. O. The Race, Health, and Happiness podcast was created by Dr. Ani Norum, and she's our host. I'm Dr. Carl Cabasell, executive producer of the show. Our technical producer is Obadiah George. Our showrunner is Cam, and J.L. Joseph is associate producer. Promotions coordinator is Jordan Gibson. And Javiera Violeta Duran Quieres is our logistics coordinator. Tamika E. Latibodier is our research consultant. And Corrine Bent Womack is our anti racism consultant. Our student associate producers are Xavier Oshinowo and Afia McIntosh. Veronica Ng is our graphic design consultant. And the RHH theme song is composed and performed by Gold Keys. Special thanks to Awit Siam and Darrell Carpentier for their voiceover work. Do you have questions, feedback, ideas to share? We would love to hear from you. You can connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at Race Health Happy. And check out the show notes for research that was referenced in this episode, as well as other bonus material. Our website is racehealthhappiness.com. Thank you for listening to Race, Health, and Happiness, and please subscribe to us anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. This is Dr. Carl. On behalf of the whole RHH team, we'll talk with you soon. Race, Health, and Happiness podcast is brought to you with help from Toronto Metropolitan University and with support from subscribers and listeners like you. Overcome the obstacles of racism while staying happy and healthy. Donate today at patreon.com backslash race, health, happy. We are learning together to thrive. Thank you for your support. The Race, Health, and Happiness podcast is made better by the skills, knowledge, and creative passion of the journalism students who work right here on the show. These students join us from Toronto Metropolitan University. Thank you for the hard work, folks. We appreciate you.